Testosterone and steroids, risk of excessive phlebotomy. That's today's video. There's so much of this going on in the world, I had to do a video on this. Men take testosterone, millions of men and steroid users. The androgens definitely affect the red blood cell production, not on every man and not the same. Some men certainly may require some soft or careful phlebotomy. Other men will not and excessively phlebotomizing these people is going to end up potentially with other problems in the future that we're not aware of. So there's no better way to communicate this as a case study. So I've seen this. This is actually a real isolated case study that I thought depicts such a great example of how I could share this to the world for patients, you men in the world, thank you and of course physicians that are caregivers that really need to know this, that we just don't know about this. You can definitely see my other videos that I've discussed aspects of a medical phlebotomy and red blood cell production with men on steroids. So, it starts off with a 39-year-old man who's been under my care for about five years or so, maybe more. Uh, he's a Caucasian man, and he has a history of steroid use, and now he's off the steroids, and he's uh, doing very well on TRT. Um, for this presentation, he has no other medical issues, really. He's otherwise a healthy young man, but he does have obstructive sleep apnea, and he's been utilizing a CPAP machine um, for years. So otherwise he's doing great and he comes into me, we're routinely monitoring his labs, April 2019, his hemoglobin is 17.6, his hematocrit is 50.6. At that time I reviewed his labs, he had no symptoms that time, he's feeling well. In the past with this man, he's had hemoglobins and hematocrits about this, maybe a little higher, but not much higher, and we will discuss the uh, standard of what a hemoglobin and a hematocrit actually really is in the world because there's variation on that. So at that time I review the labs with him, he has no symptoms, he feels well and I said look if you want you can go to American Red Cross for example and uh, give blood. It's a nice thing to do, it helps people save lives. They'll take off a little blood, um, do it every six months. That's for men that were just more or less treating the number, they're free of symptoms. I, I like to do that. So he says, thank you, doc, and see you later. And I, um, he goes into the queue where I'm going to check his blood routinely in the next four to six months. So in that time period from leaving, about, um, I think it was about 60 days later, within two months or so, he started having some symptoms. And the symptoms were that he was aware of his heart rate. He was really aware of his heart beating, which, um, caused general anxiety for him, so made him anxious. He had a heavy beat, felt heavy beat. Really not palpitations, and he had no chest pain, no shortness of breath, just was aware of this. And he's um, not a guy that you say is an anxious guy per se, and certainly not general anxiety uh, or acute anxiety uh, disorder guy, no mood disorders, um, but he had this symptom, you, you know, he had this. So he thought, like so many men, that it was related to his red blood cells that, that we discussed were certainly a little, little bit elevated on that scale. On the, This is Quest Labs on that scale, 17.6 and 50.6%. So he, uh, upon his own, upon his own, um, didn't call me, um, he decides to go online and he purchases phlebotomy kits. Now I've seen this. I've seen this for years, but I'm seeing it more and more. And he buys apparently six kits or more, he's used six kits, that's 470 milliliters. It's exactly the kits that are used at American Red Cross or anywhere where you donate blood. And he also used a 16-gauge um, needle, which is quite large needle. He was able to, he did that himself, which is incredible. It's amazing that he was able to do that for himself. And he took off in a period of about four months, five, six months or so, he took off six units of blood. Now, then he comes to see me. So let's go from the April lapse, let's go to November 
2019 labs, so not too long ago, he does labs. What what do we have? Hemoglobin's down to 15.7 appropriately. Hematocrit's 47.1, looks great. Now, when you're monitoring and you're getting involved with this as an expert physician on this, you really have to understand not just the CBC, which is the hemoglobin hematocrit, you have to understand um, iron studies, which are really going to be discussed here, which are more details of how you're processing and storing iron in your body, more than just the hemoglobin hematocrit. So his iron level is low normal at 61 micrograms per deciliter. His iron binding capacity is upper limit normal. This is appropriate for someone who may be losing blood. 339 micrograms per deciliter range here, 250 to 425. The interesting piece of this presentation is his percent saturation is 18%, that's low, uh, 20 to 48%, and his ferritin, which is the storage form, is really, it's low, 13 nanograms per milliliter. The range of that is 38 to 380. You'd never see that in anyone who otherwise is not anemic or having some blood loss chronically. So over that period, that's what he caused on himself. Now, again, now he came to me and he told me he was feeling well. He said, Doc, I'm going to explain those labs. I know you see what's going on. You probably know I've been phlebotomizing myself. And he told a story and he said he, those symptoms led him to believe that he was having those symptoms from the excessive red blood cells, so he phlebotomized himself. And he turns out that it really at least wasn't the main cause, and he feels that he had an allergy to milk. Now, we're going to leave that alone for what it is. It's very interesting differential diagnosis of food allergies versus other medical issues with anxiety. This is very complicated. That's why we need to have specialists in the world that are expert internists, that are fully dedicated to taking care of men on androgens, which what I call is testosteronology, because it's very, very complicated. You better understand cardiology and hematology, not to mention uh, gastroenterology and other aspects of internal medicine. You better really understand it well. This is very complicated stuff. There's so much we don't know. So that's what he does. When he comes to me, he feels, well, doc, I'm done. I'm all set. I'm going to sit on this. So I, I told him, you know, just sit tight. You're doing well. He's asymptomatic. His vital signs were fine. And we're going to recheck in about 90 days his, uh, his CBC. And I will recheck these iron levels and ferritin. You'll see they'll start to go back up and he'll just go back to where he is. Now, what do we do? What is this called? This is called androgen-induced erythrocytosis. You can see the other videos that can lead to polycythemia, which is many red blood cells. The functional diagnosis is based on two things. It's based on the hemoglobin and the hematocrit and symptoms. The hemoglobin hematocrit is really the main piece that people look at when they get red cells checked on a CBC, just a basic CBC. But the truth is, not all the reference ranges are going to be the same, and experts will disagree to some degree. So there's no question that a normal hemoglobin, upper limit normal, is 18 grams per deciliter equal to or less than. It's between 17 and 18. But if you're just 17, 17.2, and you're just 0.1 over, 17.1, the lab says, hi, so many doctors and patients get nervous when there may not be a need to be nervous. Let's keep following this. Symptoms are very important. Hematocrit. This range on this classic quest range goes to 50%. He's 50.6. It says, hi. Anyone looks at it says, hi, wow, you have polycythemia, when the truth is, do you really have polycythemia? Is it functional? Is it because of the labs? Is there symptoms? It's so complicated, we have no outcome studies really on this at all. That's why we need to. 54%, so 18 for the hemoglobin and 54. A lot of labs in the world will agree and say 54 is normal. So it's equal to or less than 54. Please understand that this is, there is, there is variation on these labs. Risk factors for androgen-induced erythrocytosis is going to be of the following. Susceptible men, race. Men, Caucasian men that have European ancestry have genes, and they're more susceptible to this. No question, I've seen it for over a decade. Next, age. Young men don't get 
polycythemia, so much, of course some can. I have seen this, young men can do so much steroids when they're in their 20s and red cells are tight, never go up and then all of a sudden they're on TRT, not even steroids and they see polycythemia, doc, in my 30s, 40s, 50s, why? There's some age related factor we don't know. Maybe you get older, you're getting more sleep apnea or something or we just don't fully understand. No, next, sleep apnea is huge. Such an underlying component. So many men are telling me and showing me that I've learned that they just use a CPAP machine and they just treat sleep apnea, almost forget even getting diagnosed. They just use a jump to the CPAP or BiPAP rarely and they treat that and that itself keeps down this excessive uh, red blood cell drive. That's amazing and I have to share that with the world because this is what my men and my experience over years has shown me. I have to share that with you. More to that in the end with management. Race, Caucasian men, African American men, Asian men, Hispanic men, they could definitely get this too. But it's more it's much more susceptible and sensitive in Caucasian men because of that hereditary hemochromatosis gene, the European gene that we that, that is there. Sleep apnea, the genes. Hereditary hemochromatosis, there is if you have full blown homozygote, you're gonna be off the chart in this stuff. I've seen it. So many men are have carrying states and there's different gene variations on this. It's really relevant. You have to go see an expert hematologist or a testosteronologist that I'll be training on this stuff. Polycythemia vir with a JAK2 mutation, that's another, that's a kind of a chronic uh, low-grade myelodysplastic uh, blood cancer scenario that's very rare, but all hematologists are good doctors. They're going to check for this stuff to rule it out when it's really in the end a sensitive man that is on androgens, even a little bit of testosterone, not just full-blown steroids, decadrobo and equipoise and all this stuff, you know. Um, uh, they're sensitive, and again, they have some sleep apnea, the genes, it's all mixed in, it's multifactorial. So, and then in the end, risk factors are steroids. No question that certain types of steroids like decadrobo and equipoise, not to mention other drugs, that they're gonna, when you use them together, in a dose-dependent fashion, you're going to see a increased sensitivity on the red blood cells. Okay, so symptoms when it comes down to diagnosing the polycythemia. What, what do you have? The classic symptoms that doctors will look for and have to ask. Headaches. I have headaches, blurry vision, dizziness, malaise and fatigue. It can lead to hypertension, shortness of breath. Neurologic. The neurologic phenomenon is very, very interesting and it's very non-specific. This man, this man, 39-year-old man, he had, this is C neurologic, that's that, he had some anxiety, that's neurologic. He had non-specific neurologic, he had the, the heavy beat of the anxiety, but again, in his case, he feels it wasn't from the red cells and it may not have been, it may have been an allergy to milk. So you just understand how humbling this is, it's so complicated. But there are a lot of men that I see that can have these symptoms and they can, is it just from real polycythemia or is it some other medical condition? You need to have a personal physician that's a real physician, that's a really hard hammering internist that's trained well and humble and knows how to deal with this man per man. No question in the world. One of the dangers of androgen induced with the cytosis, it leads to polycythemia, dangerous. There's no outcome studies. We have no idea, but what are the potential and what do we worry about risks? So clots, forming a clot, you have all this extra red blood cells and you're gonna be hypercoagulable. Okay, hypercoagulability on the venous side, the veins, you're gonna have DVTs and pulmonary embolisms. This is real, guys. Antigens definitely can increase the risks for DVTs, hypercoagulable state, and PEs, no question. There's so many variabilities in genetic susceptibilities. No question about that. I've seen it for years. And when you see the classic risks of men on TRT, you're going to see DVT's hypercoagulable state. So in the veins, DVT and pulmonary embolisms. Please, it's very important. Now, on the arterial side, which I talk about all the time, heart attack and stroke. So. If you have a clot in the vein side, that's DVT, it can lead to a PE, not to mention it could damage the, the actual limb itself. We've seen that in some, some professional bodybuilders. It's, it's a tough uh, stories here. These are tough, tough histories. And then of course, it does a man have a heart attack or a stroke because he has 
enough risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, family history, he's got some plaque in the artery, then he's, he has heavy blood. He has the thickened blood. Does that tip him over the edge and pow, he has a heart attack or a stroke? Please, it's, I see this. There's so many variabilities. Keep the risks down. That's what I do and that's what I say. So, that's what it is. That's what it is. Management. How can this be managed? How should men on androgens be managed when it comes to the red cells? History and physical. Know the associated risks. Caucasian, getting older, sleep apnea, get the genes. Got, doctors can check this. Anyone can check this online now. Everyone's kind of doing their own thing. So, and steroids. You have to be careful. You have to be careful with testosterone too. There's no free lunch. Testosterone replacement even, it's not for everyone. You better understand all the risks on this before you do even testosterone, not to mention steroids. Look how complicated this is. Okay, so those are the associated risks. Get a good history and physical, part one. Next, monitor. You monitor the CBC. You monitor with the iron studies. You can get those iron studies you can see is, is, is it, and see a hematologist or a testosteronologist that's an expert in doing this that I'm training now. So is this excessive red cells really excessive? Do you have symptoms? And now are you getting iron overload? Well, look at the ferritin level. Look at the percent saturation. Look at the iron studies. This is discrete. You could use these. Doctors have taught me this. Hematologists have taught me this over years and years and years, me working with these experts on this. We developed these protocols, my protocols, that we are gonna publish, but for today, we have no end outcome. So we have to use anecdotes, we have to be careful and conservative with people. Dose, TRT. Some gentlemen, you can't even use uh, testosterone on them. I have to use human chorionic gonadotropin, which is another secret, it's another share, with sleep apnea uh, status management. TRT, using the lowest possible dose, steroids in different types, I already talked about that, that's going to be a risk. The biggest, most common and easiest thing to do is to really look at that sleep apnea drive. The drive for why the body increases red blood cells is driven by low oxygen saturation. We know that's the basis for this thing underlying on top of the androgen. So check the sleep apnea status. Maybe just try CPAP. Just put it, I know guys don't always like to wear it. Most guys don't, but if it's gonna save your life and you could stay on testosterone, that's a great thing. That's really, that could be a, a game changer. Next thing, last piece, careful phlebotomy. Careful phlebotomy. I do use phlebotomy. If I'm looking at a man where I could get the lowest dose of testosterone, get him off of steroids, Treat the underlying issues with sleep apnea, again for the 10th time, and then use a low dose of testosterone so he feels well, and then maybe he can phlebotomize maybe twice a year. That's game on. You see that? That's game on. That's a perfect balance. If, and of course, getting a blessing from his primary care doctor, cardiologist, hematologist, working with a group, not isolating and being a lone wolf. Don't, the doctors who do that, are, are that's not gonna be good. You wanna work as a team. If you don't know something, say you don't know it, and let's and let's all learn together. So conservative, be conservative, be careful. You start seeing hematocrits up over mid 50s and 60, you're going to be in trouble. And those guys may or may not feel well. There's going to be problems in the out. There's going to be end outcome problems with that. Hemoglobin's up to 18, over 18, uh, 19, 20. I've seen 22, 23. There's going to be problems. You have to get monitored. You have to get checked for what's going on with this. So. A little bit of phlebotomy again, balancing a guy, making sure he's breathing great at night, he's got some CPAP going on maybe if he needs it, losing weight, of course I want you to want to hear that, get in great shape and lose weight. Um, so putting it all together, this is so complicated, I love to present this for you guys out there. I really hope this stimulates great conversation with the comments and in the end I hope it helps men. Thank you so much.